welcome to the Jazz Roundtable, brought to you by Live at Zero BPM, with your host, Grammy Award-winning percussionist and mallet player, Billy Holting. Tonight's guests, the multifaceted Grant Geisman. And we don't charge a cover, but musicians are paid exclusively by your tips, so we strongly encourage you to do so. Just go to live at 0ppm.com slash tip jar. You can also tip on Venmo at C-E-R-O-B-P-M. And now, let's get to the music with your host, Billy Holting. everybody. Uh, hey, welcome to another Jazz Roundtable. We we just got our, our stuff up and running in time to do the show. It literally, we were troubleshooting until li- about two minutes ago. So, I, see, I haven't even placed my camera yet for today. So, uh, really excited. Hey, Grant Geisman is here. The amazing Grant Geisman. You've all heard him play. You've all heard him compose. And we're going to talk a lot about everything. But let me bring Grant on here. And if I can get everything to work properly, let's see. Oh, there he is, Grant Geisman, ladies and gentlemen. Hey. Ah, oh, thanks for the applause. Very kind of you. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun having Grant here. He just played a couple of weeks ago with uh, Lyman Baderos. That was super fun. It was. And now we get to talk to him because Grant is... One of the reasons I really wanted to have him on the show is uh, not as he's a great guitar player. Everybody knows him. I guess your, your first big thing was the guitar solo on Chuck Mangione's hit, uh, Feels So Good. Certainly was. But you've also played with a ton of people. You've done a bunch of sessions, and uh, and you have several books out. Grant is a very well-rounded human being. You know, he doesn't just play guitar and do that, but uh, he has written a bunch of books. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his compositions. He did Two and a Half Men and Mike and Molly, and he was nominated for an Emmy for the theme to Two and a Half Men. We're going to get into all that. But, you know, we like to start out here on the old jazz roundtable. Uh, well, first, let me say, we are 100% tip-based. I'll put the links in the, in the chats, but they should be in the descriptions. Uh, that's how we, uh, that's how we pay the guests, how we keep the lights on and all that good stuff. So if you're inclined and want to say thank you, uh, please do so. And let's see. Uh, but let's get to you. the origin story is what we like to start out with. So, Grant, how did you get into guitar and into music in general? I mean, not to date myself too much, but, you know, it's, it's inevitable. <clears throat> but, um, you know, actually, I grew up in San Jose, and... There was a, some kids a couple years older than me that had like a surf music band with Fender Jaguars and, you know, dr- cool drums. And, and so I used to, after school, see these kids play. Like, you know, they lived kind of around the corner. And I thought, man, those guitars are cool. I remember the chrome glistening off, the, you know, the sun glistening off the chrome of the Fender Jaguar. And I thought, that is so cool. And then when the Beatles came out, it was like, okay, that's it. I'm getting a guitar. And I badgered my parents for like probably a good six months. Um, I, can, can I have a guitar? Can I have a guitar? And I'm sure they thought I was going to outgrow it, but I kept bugging them. And finally, you know, under the Christmas tree uh, that Christmas was a, uh, you know, an acoustic guitar. And I started taking lessons and the rest is history. But, you know. It was, a, it was a good place to grow up because there were all these garage bands around when I was a kid. Oh, I'm sorry, my mic was off. That, that's great. Now, what were you playing in the garage bands? You playing just Beatles tunes or? Yeah, you know, Beatles tunes, The Who, Kinks, uh, you know, later Cream, but even surf music a little bit, Wipeout. I actually, um, <laughs> my eighth grade talent show, me and two other buddies, it was me, a rhythm guitar player, and a drummer, no bass. We played Wipeout. And uh, um, <clears throat> we won third place in the talent show. Uh, the, the second place was a, a, the, a band like a year older than us or something like uh-huh. that. Or oh, maybe we were in seventh grade. Because the band, the second place band was the year older than us. And the first place contestant was some girl that w- like recited poetry or something. It's like, what is uh-huh. happening? <laughs> but anyway, and I still have the trophy. Third place, you know, Rogers <laughs> Junior High. <laughs> well, it's funny. I actually played Wipeout with a marimba trio at the Isomata Music Camp uh, talent show one year. There, did, you know, we, it's a timeless classic. It, it is. <laughs> we did, and then I think the third marimba player, she played the Tom Tom solo when we did the breakdowns. It was pretty funny. Awesome. So it's a great tune. It works well on every instrument. It does. <laughs> it does. So, um, well, that's cool. <clears throat> when did you get into playing jazz then? So, you know, I, I took lessons right away, and, you know, I for a few years... Um, 
And then I just got with a teacher that was like, uh, you know, I love pop tunes and all that. I love, you know, rock, but mm -hmm. maybe uh, you can learn how to play this G 13th chord or, you know, I was like, oh, uh, you know, maybe you could learn how to play like Sunny or something, you know. Oh, wow. Maybe a, a song that has a few more chords. And, and uh, so he kind of steered me that way. And, um, and then I kind of became schizophrenic, which I still basically am. Uh, because I was, you know, um, kind of studying jazzy stuff a little bit, you know, in high school and, and playing in big bands and stuff like that. But then in the garage and even on weekends, I would play in rock bands. So um, definitely schizoid, you know. Well, were you listening to jazz before he taught you or did he introduce you no, to No, I wasn't. No, not listening to jazz at all. Although, although my mom bought me a Howard Roberts album. Wow. Um, and I think Howard did A Hard Day's Night on there. But I was, I didn't like it. I didn't like the brass. It didn't sound like the Beatles. I don't know. I don't know what's happening here. So, you know, I started playing in big bands through, through, um, through high school. And then when I was a senior in high school, I started studying with this guitar player called Jerry Hahn, who uh, had a group called the Jerry Hahn Brotherhood. But Jerry had played with Gary Burton and John Handy and... Um, so he introduced me to people like, you know, John Coltrane mm. and Charlie Parker and, and, you know, had me listen to Wes Montgomery and Jimmy Smith and stuff like that. So, you know, he really opened my ears because before that it was kind of like Buddy Rich Big Band stuff. That was the extent of my jazz knowledge, really. Yeah, I get it. Going through high school, jazz to me was the old big bands. Yeah, you know, that's it. it. Until I got to Cal State Northridge, which we're going to talk about a little bit, uh, <laughs> that I really got into the, the hipper stuff there. So, um, sorry, just since we were a little delayed, I have to get my notes together, but uh, uh, just to, you know, take care of some things. Okay, I'll put myself back up here so we can have it. Do we have a word from the sponsors? We have to cut to commercial or anything like that? <laughs> we will cut to a commercial later on when I announce who's going to be playing coming up. And ah, then ah. Sometimes, I like during the, the live shows, you know, we talk to the audience a lot. I try to do that in, in minimal pockets throughout these uh, because I'm trying to have a conversation with you. If I find myself reading too much of the YouTube and Facebook and Twitch comments, I, I get distracted. But I want to go back to the... So you're, you're playing in the rock bands, and I'm guessing you're soloing and improvising there, right? Yeah. And, and I, I found... In fact, I remember specifically specifically one rehearsal that I had with these kids and I played a solo like I don't remember on what tune now mm -hmm. really but they're like wow what was that solo do that again and I was like I don't know but I remember it, it feeling and sounding good you yeah. know so I, I kind of had a knack for melodic kind of soloing you know and not just it was based on pentatonic scales I'm sure mm -hmm. but I, I made a, I must have made some kind of cool melody or something and I remember this, you know, and I was like, huh. And so I really kind of did have a knack for that, I think. And then when you were learning the jazz tunes with your instructor, were you then learning to solo over changes at the same time, or were you just yeah. playing the songs? Or Well, yeah, yeah. You know, um, kind of real book tunes, or actually more like Charlie Parker tunes, you know, bebop wow. tunes, um, stuff like that. Jump and then trying to figure out how to, you know, straight note chaser too. Um, try to figure out how to get through changes and, you know. Uh-huh. So you just went right to the deep end of the pool. Well, I mean, it's kind of. I mean, not. It, it wasn't. It was. You know, it was step by step. It right. wasn't like, here, kid. You know, you yeah. you just played "Sunshine of Your Love." Now let's do giant steps. It wasn't that. You know. Yeah, you got to do confirmation on the way. <laughs> the giant yeah. steps. You have to so. do Bernie's bounce before you get to. Uh, you know. Or everybody's favorite beginner tune, "Blue Bossa." I, I didn't learn blue boss really? at that time. No, that was the first song I ever played at a public jam session. Wow! <laughs> so, uh, well, that's cool. I used to and, play like Ah Pravav, you know, and uh, you know Charlie mm -hmm. Parker kind of tunes, oh, beboppy blues tunes. Now, you grew up in Northern California. Yes, yeah, San Jose. San Jose, and so were there were were there other guys that were into jazz playing with you in high school? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, there were actually, you know, because there were guys from the big band. Mm -hmm. And so we put a little small group together and stuff like that. Cool. This, this was more like, this would have been like senior in high school kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And then even going into the first year or two of college. Oh, okay. And where'd you go to school? Well, oh, you, went to... <laughs> you mean up there? I went to De Anza Junior College, which is actually, they had a very good music department. Dr. Herb Patno uh -huh. was in charge of it. And um, he was able to recruit some very good players for the, just this little local junior college. That's great. And then at the same time, kind of, he recommended me to this group 
It was a, um, a youth jazz ensemble <laughs> sponsored, sponsored somehow or other by the Explorer Scouts. It was a tenuous connection at best. But they were called the Blue Saints. And actually, we went to, um, in 1970, we went to Japan on a tour for like three weeks. Oh, wow. And then I think around 72 or 3, 72, I don't know, we went to Europe for three weeks with this Blue Saints, you know, youth jazz ensemble. Wow, that's awesome. Great, you know. <laughs> that's cool. And then uh, when did you move down south? So, um, I, you know, I'd gone through a couple of years at um, De Anza Junior College, and I was playing with various people. Actually, I, I met Russ Ferrante, the keyboard player. Mm -hmm. We did some playing um, when I was at De Anza. We put a little small group together, and wow. and, um, and he sounded great even then. Um, so I, I think around the end of 73, I had heard, you know, Tom Scott on the LA Express with John Guerin and Tom Scott playing that great sax and uh, Larry Carlton, and, and it was like, man, listen to this. This is like state of the art right now, you know. And these guys are just down in Hollywood, like 325 miles away from here. I got to get down there. So that's what I did. I, I moved down to the LA area at the end of 73. And I went one semester to Cal State Fullerton because I heard that they had a good kind of jazz band department, which they did. Mm -hmm. Tom Rainier was, um, was directing it at that time. And some great players like Dave Krieger, um, you know, some really good, uh, you know, band members and stuff, and great music. But um, after one semester, I realized Fullerton is too far away from kind of the Hollywood scene. Mm -hmm. And I transferred up to Northridge, which, you know, worked out great. And uh, full disclosure, I went to Northridge also, but I was, like, right after you left, I think I came in to school. What year did you graduate? Or, well, I, I should have graduated <laughs> somewhere at, you know, at um, early 77. Okay. But in November of 1976, my phone rang at my little apartment in Van Nuys. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, hey, this is Chuck Mangione. And I was like, hi. And uh, he goes, hey, um, you know Bill, Re Bill Reichenbach, this trombone player? I go, yeah. And he goes, well, he recommended you for this gig at the Santa Monica Civic. Uh, I want to know if you want to do it with me. And I was like, yes, I think so. Thank you. I will do that, please. And um, so it was, you know, it was like kind of a one-off gig. We did a rehearsal the day before, and um, it was kind of a, a, you know, small orchestra gig that he did sometimes, like with horns and maybe some strings. Um, and he liked it, and he said, well, look, we're doing a, a few more dates, like in the Pacific Northwest, maybe another five or six days or something. Yeah. Do you want to go with us? And I was like, okay. And I was like, who cares about school? And so I kind of cut classes for those six days. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, you know, he liked it. And not too long after that, he was looking to add a guitar player and put a new band together. And he asked me to join. And I said, bye, Northridge. You know, forget about my four general education classes I still have to take. <laughs> uh, see ya. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, I, wonder, I, I, didn't, I didn't read whether you had left, uh, if, they, if you got discovered out of school earlier, if you had, had finished up there. So that's, uh, that's actually pretty amazing. And then, so you were in the band for a, a year or so before the album came out, right? With the, the famous the man, album. Yeah, well, yeah. So I joined in something like, you know, the end of 76, and then we put a new band together probably in January-ish or something with James Bradley Jr. and mm -hmm. Charles Meeks. All, all three of the rhythm guys were from L.A. And then, you know, we went on the road and whatever. And I think we started recording Feel So Good in August of 77. So we'd been on the road, and we were a pretty tight band, you know. Uh, you know, <laughs> full of piss and vinegar, basically, young kids. Yeah. Um, and so we, you know, just got in the studio and we, we did feel so good. Well, that's awesome that he used his touring guys, because I know there are some cats out there that kind of had their session guys and then their recording guys, their live guys were separate. So well, here was the thing. I was kind of ballsy. Yeah. Um, so he, when he asked me to join the group, he called up and he goes, can you meet me for breakfast or whatever at, at Sportsman's Lodge in the little kind of breakfast <laughs> yeah. area they have? I probably still have it. Um, and so I met him there, and he asked me to join the band. I said, okay, well, here's the thing. I would love to join your band, but you have to guarantee that I'm going to play on your albums because wow. I don't want to just be a road guy. Um, and he was kind of like, okay. Well, I mean, he liked my playing enough yeah. to say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm good with that. That's and he great. used his band anyway, really, because yeah. 
you know, it was Jerry Nywood and Chip Jackson and Jola Barbara and whatever. He always recorded with his band, except for on the album before Feel So Good, which was called Main Squeeze, mm. which he used all New York studio guys. Oh. So it was like Steve Gadd and, and uh, Bob Mann was one of the guitar players. I think John Trope was, was the other guitar player. Um, and so I think that's why I asked that, because I knew he had done a studio album. And I, I didn't want to just be a road guy. Right. Because I was actually already starting to do pretty good around town. You know, doing, doing some jingles and some recordings and, you know, getting by fine. Like, and so I knew to go on the road, like, you basically say goodbye to all that. Right. So, so I said that, you know, and uh, kind of ballsy, but he said, okay. That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I do have a quick Chuck Mangione story. I was in the, uh, the uh, youth orchestra, and he came in to be our conductor, our guest conductor once. Yeah. And the one embarrassing thing is all of our gear had been locked up somewhere else. We were playing on scraps of whatever we could find, and he kept asking if we had better bass drum mouths, all the stuff we didn't. But one thing I remember is that he would close his eyes and conduct yeah. and open it to turn the page and then close his eyes again and conduct until the next page turned where he'd open his eyes, turn the page. And, but he was super cool, super nice to us. It was really a fun gig. He so. really knew his own music, you know. Yeah. He knew how to conduct it. He had a kind of frenetic, bouncy kind of conducting style, but it was very effective because you knew what he wanted. That's you know, great. he had a lot of energy, and sometimes you need that, at, from, you know, from a conductor. Yeah, and I always uh, applaud the guys like he and Maynard who would get young guys, like right out of school, and take them on the road and give them the experience and everything. So Yeah, I'm sure, you know, some of that was eco economic, don't you yeah, think? Yeah, but, um, I'm sure. <laughs> but but uh, no, that, that's, you know, all these bands were breeding, breeding grounds for young players, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I, I agree. Hey, so we have a, a, a little track we could play some of. Which is? The, uh, it is called... Uh, uh, Chick and Chuck. Chuck okay, so this, um, you know, fast forward many years later. So, I, you know, I was on the road with Chuck for about four years, I think, the first time around. And then I, or maybe it was three years plus, and I took like a year off, and then I came back. Um, and then we parted ways for quite a while. And then around 93, we started doing some Feel So Good reunion tours. And then on and off, I did stuff with him, you know, over the years. So... Fast forward to when I had started my little label and I was doing an album called Cool Man Cool and I had written this tune called Chuck and Chick because around the time we did Feel So Good, there was talk that Chuck Mangione and Chick Corea were going to do an album together. And, you know, they talked about it and it never happened, but that always stuck in my mind like, huh, I wonder what that would have sounded like. So I decided to write a tune called Chuck and Chick, where the first part of the tune would hopefully sound kind of like a Chuck Mangione tune, and the second part of the tune would sound like a Chick Corea tune, oh, you wow. know, trying to figure out what that would have sounded like. And so, you know, I wrote it, and I sent it to Chuck and asked him if he'd play on it, and he's like, yeah. So I flew him out, you know. He's been flying me all over the world all these years, so I flew him out and uh, you know, put him up in a hotel and we rehearsed and he went to the studio and, and uh, it was super fun. Anyway, that's Chuck and Chick and that's what you're gonna hear right now, Chuck. Oh, and then later I asked, um, because it was coming out so great, I asked Chick Corea if he would play on it and he said okay too. Oh, wow. So both Chuck and Chick Corea are on this track. Okay, so uh, all of you out there in internet land, we did not get a chance to sound check this. I'm gonna play a little clip and then I'm gonna and check the levels, then stop it, and then we'll go back and play it from the beginning again. So, uh, and then Grant will do some interpretive dance, which won't, won't translate into the podcast. It'll look a lot like I'm sitting here. That'll be my <laughs> interpretive. Yeah, thing. it is very, but Let me just yeah. check this. Uh, Okay, I can edit that out later on, but I just wanted to get a level on the, the music. So this is, and then just Grant, you know, when, when we've played enough, just raise your hand and I will, uh, and I will, I will. We have to play for a while because I want you to hear Chuck play and oh, also okay. Chick Corea play. So it's going to be, sit back and relax for a minute. Okay, and you YouTube and uh, uh, Facebook bots. The, Grant wrote the song. I wrote we the song. I own, I own the copyright. I own the actual sound recording. It's on my label, so yeah. leave us alone. Yeah, so don't at me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go.
that's all the people out there in uh, our internet land watching. The, and, uh, and that was that was a really great tune. And I'm, I'm guessing you were playing the acoustic guitar on that. Yeah, that was me. <clears throat> that's really, really beautiful. Uh, Rick Converse, uh, who, who tipped, and so did Andre. Thank you guys for Thank you, Rick and Andre. They're both uh, regulars. Andre is a guitar player here in town, and Rick is a uh, major jazz fan. He's always great. And, and let me just say, since we're here, we got Phil from the Great White North is watching. Wayne from Wisconsin is here. Toby, our local from Encino, is here. Diana, who is a fellow CSUN alumni, she says, yay, CSUN. <laughs> uh, and then Peg Lake Pete says, the cover is great. Hope you own that, too. The artwork, I yeah. do. That's... Um my friend Miles Thompson did three album covers for me, wow. and kind of that 50s, you know, uh, Jim Flora kind of style. It's and, beautiful. Um, it's so cool. And I have that artwork framed in my studio. Ah, very cool. Uh, well, while we're, we're on the subject of these albums, I've got a couple of other album covers up here. Let me see if I can find the... Uh... Okay, so here, let me just put this up on the screen. This is... That was Cool Man Cool. That's the album that has Chuck and Chick on there, and also two other tunes that Chuck Mangione played on. And then you have, uh, here's another album. That's the first album in the kind of trilogy. Um, that album's called Say That, and it also has uh, Miles Thompson artwork on it. Oh, I want to go back to Cool Man Cool for a bit, because on your bio, you have a great line that just says, the second in the trilogy, Cool Man Cool, features uh, cool music I like to play, cool people I like to play with. That was basically the vibe, you know? That's such a great description. <laughs> And then let's see, we have another album here. Uh, there we go. And that's kind of the third album in this little trilogy, also with, uh, you know, Miles Thompson artwork. Yeah. And that album is called Bop, Bang, Boom. Yeah. Now, when, when, was, when were these put, released? Oh, man, let's see. I think Say That came out in 2006, and um, Cool Man Cool maybe 2009. Okay. And probably uh, Bop, Bang, boom, maybe 2012. And then I took 10 years off, <laughs> and now I'm working on a brand new CD. Yeah, you said it's almost finished. It's Yeah, pr almost finished. Wait, waiting on a couple guest artists to do their thing, but pretty much done. What can you tell us about it? Well, we have some fun guests this time. Um, Tom Scott played on a couple wow. things. Um, Randy Brecker played on a tune. Um, Russ Ferrante played on about half the record. Jim Cox. Wow. played keyboard on the other half. Um, my friend Josh Smith is on a track with me, and we're waiting for a, a slot, um, and I don't want to say the name in case it doesn't happen, Okay. but another guitar player buddy. A mystery guest. Yeah, a mystery guest, um, coming soon, hopefully. But um, super fun, and the concept of this album is, is um, everything is bluesy in some way. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily blues, but everything is bluesy in one way or an another. And actually, since we're talking about it, if you want to play the track that has Randy Brecker, we could do a sneak uh, look at, you know, advanced look at my new album. Which one? What is that called? Um, the tune? Uh -huh. The tune is called Praise. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, did you play that with Lyman? I, I think we did play okay. that with Lyman. Yeah, I'm yeah. Gonna, let me play a little. And which album is this? This is from the new album. So we the don't new have album. An album cover. Oh, it was the same guy doing the album artwork? I haven't decided that yet. I don't know. I might do something different. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, let's play this then. <laughs> Thank you. 
we go. All right. So Don't want to give too much away. Randy Brecker, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and uh, somebody wants to know who was uh, on drums on that track. Uh, Ray Brinker. Oh, cool. And um, Trey Henry on bass and Jim Cox on B3. Okay. Uh, it, someone was asking if it was Jim doing the organ and electric piano as well. So. It's actually Jim doing organ and acoustic piano. Acoustic piano. Piano, cool. piano. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, oh, so Peg Lake Pete, is, uh, it says it, to say hi from Tom from Las Vegas. Okay. Because uh, he's known you forever. <laughs> Tom from, I don't know, well, I don't know. Hi, Tom. I don't know who that is, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have a lot. Maybe he'll put a last name up there, so yeah. uh, we can do that. So, very cool. And uh, we got a couple of the clips. But do you feel like playing something live for us? Uh, if you like, yeah, that'd be kind of fun. Let's see what the audience says. Yeah, they say yes. Uh, well, they, they, that was very truncated applause. I don't, I'm not feeling that. I can't. Well, you they know. didn't want to cover up and. Okay, okay, okay. If you insist, you know. I mean, <laughs> they're relentless. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to play, um, you know, most of my stuff is not really, you know, designed for solo guitar, uh -huh. um, you know, because I kind of play with a band and whatever, so, but be that as it may, I'm going to play the title tune from my Say That album, okay. so, and just pretend there's a bass player and a drummer and I'll fill in as best I can. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Very cool. Yeah, I didn't miss the bass and the drums. I'm, not, I'm just going to say. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, so let's, I want to, we've <clears throat> talked a lot about the music, and we actually have some more tracks to play, but I want to jump us, skip ahead it, to the other topic that but I talk about Grant being such a well-rounded person, is a musician who does something other than music. And yes, they do exist, people. <laughs> and you're, you're an author. You've got five books out. A new one was just released. Yeah. That is not only a coffee table book, it is also a coffee table. Literally. You've got it right next to you. Holding it. It's very, it actually weighs 13 and a half pounds or something. Wow. So it's actually, it's hard. Ouch. <laughs> okay. This is it. It's called The History of EC Comics. And it's yeah. not that I'm small. It's that this is a very big book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I have, I have a bunch of covers up here. Let me just get to the uh, book one, I think. Well, this isn't... Oh, this, let's do the History of EC Comics uh, section here first. So okay. here is the, the cover. So this book... Um, first of all, I've collected, you know, Mad Magazine stuff. I started reading Mad when I was like eight years old. Uh -huh. Some kids kind of turned me on to it, and it's like, what is this, you know? And, um, and I was like, where do you get this? You know, like, well, I just at the drugstore, and I'm like, they would sell this to me? It's like, yeah, yeah you just get, take your quarter and go buy it. It's like, you know, mind blown. So I started collecting Mad and reading it when I was like eight. And I kept, you know, kept it up, and I kind of like, uh, you know, after high school, I kind of wound down, but... Um, and then there's also stuff related to MAD called EC Comics, mm -hmm. which is, was published by the same publisher, William M. Gaines. And I collected that stuff, too, from the time I was, you know, pretty young, like in, maybe the freshman in high school. So, um, and that stuff was published in the 50s, but there were comic shops, some of the very first comic shops ever to exist, oddly enough, were in San Jose, which is where wow. I grew up. So, well, you know, fast I've got a couple forward, of these other covers here. We well, can... hang on. I want to finish the story oh, of the, okay. whole, the way this whole thing started. So go back to okay. that collectively mad cover. There you so go. So I, you know, by, you know, early 90s sometime, I had a pretty big collection of Mad Magazine and EC Comics memorabilia. So <clears throat> I wrote a letter to Bill Gaines and I kind of proposed, Bill Gaines was the publisher of Mad, and I proposed like, what if there was a book of, you know, basically showing the history of MAD and EC Comics shown through its own collectibles? And um, I sent that letter off, and, and uh, I kind of didn't hear anything for a while, and so I said to my wife, Lydia, I said, well, I guess, you know, Bill Gaines didn't like my book idea. And she goes, what book idea? And it's like, I don't know, I was just thinking that I could write a book maybe, and so I sent a letter to Bill Gaines. And then a while later, it took a while though, um, I got this phone call from Gaines's publishing representative, and he was like, well, Bill's intrigued by the idea, and he wants to see some sample chapters. And I was like, oh, crap. Now I have to do it, you know? So I, I worked up a couple sample chapters, and I sent those to him, and he liked the idea, so he gave me permission to shop the book around, and we found a publisher, and then I, uh, you know, started working on it in, in earnest, and it took, quite, you know, several years to get the book finally out because there were hundreds and hundreds of objects to be photographed and de designed, and it was, you know, it was a problem. But anyway, that book came out, and that was my first book in 95. So we, we have a question. It's like, if you had to pick one Mad Magazine cartoonist, did you have a personal favorite? There's so many, you know, yeah. as far as cover artists, it would either be Norman Mingo or Kelly Freeze. Um, and I have some original artwork, artwork from both of those guys, and it's wow. just stunning. But I've actually become friends with some of the mad guys. Um, you know, some of them sadly are kind of no longer with us. My, my kind of best friend that I made there was an editor called Nick Meglin, who was just a, you know, real character. But um, he would come out to LA, and there were a lot of mad people in LA, so we would host parties at my house with oh, wow. mad people like Sergio Aragones and some of the writers like Arnie Kogan or Larry Siegel, um, different people, you know. so. It's kind of interesting. And they knew me as this mad guy. They had no idea that I was a musician. So wow. talk about schizophrenic, you so know. So what year did you did this come out? This that book came out in 95. Okay. Well, I just remember as a kid just the, the every mad magazine issue had a satire on some movie. Movie satires by Mort Drucker usually and sometimes they were by Angelo Torres. Uh-huh. And, and then the, the and then pretty much every issue would have a fold in the, at the back 
Um, and those yeah. were always done by Al Jaffe, and you would, it would, the picture would look a certain way, and if you folded it in, it would, you know, it would reveal a different answer and a different image. Yeah, it was a, a trifold, instead of a fold out, it was a fold in. Exactly, and it was a takeoff, it was the opposite of Playboy. Instead yeah. of a fold out, it was a fold in, because Matt always prided itself on being cheap. And I was also a massive fan of Spy vs. Spy. Spy vs. Mm -hmm. Spy, yeah. exactly, Antonio Prohias. Yeah, those were very cool. So, so um, great. Uh, we have some other questions, but they're music questions, so we'll get back to that when we get to music. Music? Who cares about that? <laughs> yeah, we're talking comics here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you want to go on to the next, sure. the next cover? Okay, let me get uh, the cue here, and then we have this one here. So this book came out um, in 2000, and it's kind of a celebration of all those EC comics. And it shows, it pictures every single EC comic cover, and it tells... Uh, really? what stories are in each issue, and there's interviews with the artists and with uh, the writers, and, wow. you know, it's chock full of cool stuff. And I co-wrote that with a guy named Fred von Bernowitz, who, and I based the kind of backbone of the book, he had done this little mimeograph kind of fanzine, basically in like around 55 or so, mm -hmm. 55, 56, and I used that as kind of the backbone of the information, and then I fleshed it out with interviews and full color pictures of every cover. And and um, so go. I think you have a next uh, the yeah. next image. We also did like a signed limited edition. Um, it, it's a it looks like that. It's a kind of a, in a fancy slip case, and a, you know a, a different binding on the hardcover. And go to the next image. Um, the signed limited. We actually. Pretty much every surviving EC artist that was still alive then agreed to sign these tipping sheets for this book. Wow. There were 500 copies. So, you know, I think, except for maybe one person and me, <laughs> everyone that has now signed this is now no longer with us. And I'm kind of amazed and just, you know, really honored that we were able to do this at the time. That's amazing. Yeah, incredible. Uh, let's go on to the next little graphic, we, the next cover we have. And then this is a book I did for a publisher called Harper Collins. It's called Foul Play, the Art and Artist of the Notorious 1950s EC Comics. And it has a, a separate chapter on each um, artist. And it talks about their careers before EC, during EC, and what they did afterwards. And then each um, artist gets his own uh, selected story, so you can, like a complete story from the EC comics, so you can see what their artwork looked like in context. Cool book. Okay, and then the next one we have is this one up here. And then this is a coffee table art book slash biography of Al Feldstein, who um, was an artist and a writer for EC comics in the 50s, doing like Tales from the Crypt and Weird Science and mm -hmm. You know, all kind of beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, and then he later became the editor of Mad for nearly 30 years. Wow. And he sort of found all these guys that you're talking about, you know, Mort Drucker and Al Jaffe and, mm -hmm. and uh, Sergio Aragonis and Prohias, all these guys that we talk about. Basically, all that stuff happened under Al Feldstein's editorship. Interesting. And then the last one I have on this slide's presentation and then this is a book of stuff he did in the very late 40s. Okay. Called, they were comics called Junior and Sonny, two separate titles. And they were bit kind of like Archie, kind of that kind of, you know, typical teenage kind uh -huh. of comics, except with incredibly much more titillating artwork, you know. Yeah. Um, very sh tight and short tops with accentuating the boobs. They call them headlight comics. Oh, funny. <laughs> not, not my term, I'm just saying. But uh, anyway, Feldstein did all these, and these are considered classics of what they call good girl art um, in that genre. Wow. So I assembled this, all these stories and kind of edited the book and wrote the introduction to it. That's very cool. And, and let's jump on to the next set of, this is the, going to the And history. then that'll be the new, the new book, which is this giant coffee table book like we talked about, and it's published by Tashin who, you know, that's what they do are these giant books. They actually did a couple books where they, it actually comes with a coffee table. It's, the book is so big. Oh, funny. Uh, but, and I've got some shots of the inside. Yeah. Let's take a look at this. So this is a spread of, these are all stuff from EC Comics. These are like the war comics that Harvey Kurtzman did. Mm -hmm. And these are considered the first true-to-life 
war comics where they really showed it wasn't you know glorified GI Joe kind of stuff. It was you know really the nitty gritty of death and and um, you know destruction and just you know the real horrors of war. Yeah, very cool stuff. And this is a spread from a science fiction EC comic that's done by Wally Wood, who is known for his kind of science fiction uh, artwork and also beautiful kind of babes. Yeah, as you see on the left. Yeah. And then, and that's one of the EC comics, Weird Fantasy. Let's see if I can get through. Some so there's all kinds of you know panel uh, reproductions and and you know blow ups. Um, that's a uh, chapter on the horror comics. Mm -hmm. And that's another spread. That's from a, a book they did called Shock Suspense Stories. If you look closely, you know the guy driving. He's, he's actually running, he's hitting a woman with his car, and her image is reflected in his windshield. Right. Oh, so you, wow. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. That was from a cover. And that's kind of like the contents page and, and some close-up images of some, from some of the comic stuff. That's, uh, that's pretty incredible. And that's the, that's the one that's just... That's the newest one, yeah. Very cool. And, 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 I, and I, I just heard that it's going into a second printing. Wow. It's a very expensive book. The list price is 200 bucks. Yeah. Um, but, and they did a 500, uh, excuse me, 5,000 copy print run on the first printing, and each uh, book is individually numbered. It has a little card from 1 to 5,000. Wow. And they're going into a second printing, which won't be numbered. But and, and again, you just got into it. You just had an idea and contacted the <clears throat> publisher? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's how it started out. I, I was like... Well, I always wanted to write a book. See, I, I did music all through, you know, high school and whatever, but I also did journalism for two years in college. Okay. And when I was a senior, I was like the editor of this, you know, part of the newspaper, and I wrote articles, and I edited stuff. So I kind of had a little knack for writing, too, but music was, you know, so much more powerful that that right. took over. But I always was like, I wonder what the writing thing, you know. I, I You know, I'd love to do something with that. And... Um, so that's what that first book was about. It was like, well, here's, a, here's something I know about. They always say, write what you know. And there have been no book like that before. Like, you know, a, yeah, a book on mad collectibles. That did, did not exist. The idea, like, if I looked at a book like that, I would just be, how do you even do that? You must dedicate your life to that. But it's, I, I think so many things that you can get into, if, besides music, it's just, if you want to do it, you just... Go, you just do it, do yeah. It. <laughs> you just do it. Like, you know, slow and steady wins the race, basically. Yeah. So, you know, because I was, you know, working and doing gigs and even making albums and all of that during the time I was doing all these books. So sometimes my, my wife doesn't see me for weeks at a time because I'll be, you know, I'll be in a writing mode and I'll just be, you know, I'll disappear for a couple of days and, you know. You know, well, you've kind of inspired me. I've had an idea for a book for 10 years and I just need to... You just have to do it. Do you it. just have to block out time. And then it kind of becomes like a compulsive thing. Like, okay, I, you know, you kind of see what in your head what you want it to be. And then you just keep chasing that goal, you know. That's cool. It's the same as writing a tune or, or doing an album. It's actually the same creative process. It's just applied in a different way. I just get, uh, you know, behind things, what, troubleshooting the studio all the time. <laughs> well, yeah. It's, it's priorities. Hey, know? well, let, let's just jump back into music. And okay, so music. I, do, I do have a name. Uh, uh, Peg Leg Pete is Tom Horvitz. Oh, Tom Horvitz. Yeah. Oh, I, I know. Okay, oh, got it. That yeah, too. Tom Horvitz is an old buddy of mine, and he's a, uh, he was a vintage art dealer. He handled a, a lot of original EC Comics art. Mm -hmm. And he and my buddy Jerry Wiest, who sadly is Jerry's no longer with us, but he was a big uh, EC Comics fan, and, you know, he was... Uh, consultant at Sotheby's for auctions and mm -hmm. so anyway Tom Horvitz hi good to <laughs> good to hear from you now we do have a music question from our uh, Taylor who's kind of a regular on our show and I believe he's a guitar player also but he says in your development as a guitarist what was the biggest price piece of advice someone gave you that helps shape your artistry you know um, I mean obviously practice but I'll tell you what I went and uh, I took a seminar from Barney Kessel in 1972, up in it happened to be up in Concord, and they had three instructors there. It, it was Barney Kessel, Louis Belson, and a bass player named Milt Hinton. 
So you'd hear those guys play a concert every night, and then, you know, in the daytime, Barney would do clinics and stuff like that. And one thing he said to, in, to the class, but which really stuck in my mind, he goes, don't just focus only on guitar or only on music. You know, make sure your life has other things than just those things, because you'll be a much more well-rounded person, and you can bring all that somehow back into your music, and it will inform that as well. So I really, you know, heard what he said, and I probably, <laughs> I took it too much to heart, but I've done a lot of other things apart from, you know, just playing the guitar. Oh, that's great. And, um, but it's all creative stuff, like it's, you know, yeah. writing these books and whatever. But, you know, I, I was like, huh, you don't only have to do music, you can kind of do other stuff too if you want. Yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, I, I, I firmly live that life as well. There's so much out there. So, uh, and it, you know, like you said, it, especially for other creative things like writing the book or, or, you know, if you get into video or movies or whatever you're doing, it's, a, it's kind of a cool thing. But now, Taylor has another good question. He, he says, as a compo no, composer, uh, Two and a half men, you did for 12 years. Yeah, How unbelievable. Did you get that gig? Incredible run. Well, uh, so like many things in my life, many good things, it all came from Mad Magazine in a way. Really? Because I had a buddy named Lee Aronson who I met uh, through, through some of the mad artists and stuff in town. Um, and Lee was a TV producer, but we mainly knew each other because Lee collected Mad Magazine stuff and artwork and. So, you know, I would go over to his house and he'd show me some new thing he got or I would show him some Mad Magazine thing that I got. Mm -hmm. uh, but we really, you know, he knew I was a musician, but that wasn't the thing. It was Mad Magazine. Um, and so one time he calls up and he goes, I'm working on this TV show called Life and Stuff. It's going to have Pam Dauber, Pam Dauber and this comedian called Rick Reynolds. He goes, you're a musician. Why don't you pitch a theme? And I was like, okay. So he told me what the show is about, kind of like a midlife crisis kind of thing, where the guy, you know, thinks about stuff when he was a teenager and whatever, you know, a little bit retro. And so I wrote this, I demoed up this theme and I presented it to him and that ended up being the theme for the show, wow. of this show called Life and Stuff. Unfortunately, this, uh, CBS kind of hated the show and it only aired four episodes and then they killed it. Oh. But, so I had done that little theme and um, it, did, it got on the air. And my buddy, Lee, and I, you know, kept in touch. And we, we would call up, hey, look what I just got. Look what, you know. And fa fast forward probably nearly five years later, he calls up and he goes, hey, I'm working on this show called Two and a Half Men. It's going to have John Cryer and Charlie Sheen. He goes, I think we should, you know, get together and try to pitch a theme. He goes, I don't know what it would be, but it may be some kind of Monty Python-y something. And it has to have the word men in it. So I kind of scratched down some ideas and Lee came over and we kind of made a demo and one thing led to another and, and um, Chuck Lorre liked it but and then he kind of expanded on some stuff and anyway so the three of us actually co-wrote the theme to Two and a Half Men and that's how that happened. Well I, I told you earlier my roommate's a big fan of the show and every time that theme comes on I laugh it's just it's so perfect for the show <laughs> and it is kind of, now that you mentioned it, it's very Monty Python-esque it's, it's uh, definitely has a sense of humor and it's uh, Right. Nice and short and to the point. So a little bit Monty Python and has the word men in it. So. Yeah, and so, but the interesting thing, as we were talking the other day, is uh, like we've had some other TV film composers on, but you were doing a sitcom where there was actually an audience there, and you said you were on set a lot of time because Charlie Sheen's character played a jingle writer. Right, and he would be sitting at the piano, and he doesn't play piano at all. Uh -huh. So most often, more often than not, it was me kind of behind the curtain playing piano for, for Charlie. Or sometimes it was my writing partner, Dennis C. Brown. Mm -hmm. um, once in a while we could pre-record stuff, but if there was a lot of dialogue we weaving in and out and stuff like that and he was still playing, you had to, you know, it had to be like in real time, live. Wow. So, you know, it's kind of like pay no attention to the man behind the curtain kind of thing. <laughs> and Charlie was kind of musical, so it, he looked like he was playing. Yeah. You know, he, they never showed his hands, but he, he looked like, you know, he sold it, so. Well, it's interesting, because when I've watched the show and he does that, I kind of go, you know, whoever coached him did a good job. You know? Yeah, and he, sometimes he'd, if there was a gliss, he'd go, which way do I go? And I'd have to turn around and show him, you know, what direction. Yeah. And he'd be, okay, got it. And then he, he would have it. That's and, great. Yeah. And now, Taylor, as another, like, he is, this is the question, as a composer and arranger, who do you look up to for writing music outside of the guitar? Ooh. 
That's an interesting question. I mean, so many people. Everybody, really. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't have any, like, particular favorites. I still love the Beatles. I'm so, you know, McCartney still is, he's pushing 80 if he isn't 80 already, and he's still making records and still writing some great tunes. So, I mean, that, something like that is very inspiring to me, you know. Or guys, I played with Max Bennett's band. You know, I, I heard Max on the L.A. Express records, right. which is the re one of the reasons I came down to L.A. And then years later, I played in his band, um, Max Bennett and Freeway. We did a couple albums together. And then in the last couple years of Max's life, he kind of put a band back together, and we would play a lot down kind of in Orange County and stuff. Um, and Max was like 90-something, and he still wanted to play live and, wow. you know, and write tunes and stuff. So that kind of thing is really inspiring to me. Well, yeah, it is. And Taylor has a bunch of great questions. Uh, well, one was, uh, let me see if I can get to all of them. Oh, well, he was just asked, was there any one gig or opportunity you had that was the most memorable for you in your career? Memorable? Well, I mean, probably the Mangione thing, just because sure. it was, you know, it, it kind of went from not zero to 100, but from... Kind of like, I remember driving around upstate New York in Chuck's, he had some kind of funky little brown, maybe a Ford station wagon with, you know, like a, those fake wooden panels on yeah. the side. The Squire, the Country Squire. So, not, something like that. It was a station wagon. It yeah, wasn't no, I even. I had two of those. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and we'd put all, you know, the guitar amp and the drums and all that. Yeah. And, and um, you know, he was known and he had done the main Squeeze album, which had, would, did pretty well, but still driving around to g stupid gigs in upstate New York. And then when Feel So Good came out and it was a giant hit on Top 40 Radio, yeah. it went from that to, like, you know, first-class travel and beautiful hotels and, you know, flying to all the gigs and limos and, you know, <laughs> crazy. It just, it almost, not exactly, but so, sort of from zero to 100. That's cool. And then I'm going to, this is one more question from Taylor. Thank you, Taylor, for sending in these great questions. It says, I'm assuming you had ruts in your practice uh, over time. How have you tried to get yourself unstuck when you feel like you've hit the wall? I or don't do know. hit the wall? I mean, for me, it's I try to, like, write tunes, and that's more what it's about mm -hmm. for me. Um, sometimes if I learn a new chord, then that'll become a new tune. Like, oh, I remember I learned this chord. Sort of like... What is that? E minor 7, flat 5, but that particular voicing. And I wrote this tune about because of that chord. You know, so stuff like that. Yeah. That's, that's very cool. Hey, if you can give me just a few seconds here, I'm just going to show what's uh, the upcoming schedule. Can I do the commercial? For the yes, you can. You know, you've got to pay. Keep the lights on. you got to do this. So uh, this is just so, you know, every Thursday we do live music. So this Thursday, which is two nights from now, we have Jeff Pfeiffer and Socrates' trial. And then Jeff is a young tenor player, and he's just amazing. He's got a killer band, five guys. Uh, it's guitar, keys, bass, drums, and then Jeff plays tenor. Really worth checking out. And then the following week, we have Rose Rizzo Cohen and Van Den Elzen, which is uh, uh, Joanna Rose is a vocalist, and Tom Rizzo, who you've seen on the show before, Adam Cohen on bass, and uh, I think it's Kurt Van Den Elzen is the drummer. The following week is the room ensemble, and that's Dimitris Machlis and uh, uh, Dan Lutz on bass, who, if you're not following him on Instagram, you gotta do it, Dan Lutz. I think it's Triple Lutz. Uh, and then also Chris Wabich on drums. And then the following Thursday was gonna be the trio with me and Larry and Chris, but we can't do that night. So that's a TBD. But after that, uh, Kathy Siegel Garcia is coming in and uh, with a killer band, and that'll be fun. And then we'll go on into more into May as it comes on the road. So. Uh, that was uh, that was the shortest version I could do of that. <laughs> <laughs> Great people coming up, really yeah, good. Yeah, it's, it's some it's of my been, buddies in there too. Yeah, it's been really fun to have, uh, have more people come and play, and now they're starting to call, which is great. I'm not, I'm, you know, it, things were really great during the pandemic because there were no other venues. This was one of the only ones. Uh, and now, since things have uh, opened up a bit, we still have a good viewership and all that, so it's exciting. But uh, I'm gonna, we're going to talk a little bit more about music and maybe play another cut or two. But I just want to remind you, you know, if you want a tip, I put the links in the, in the, in the uh, chat rooms. No amount is too small. No amount is too large. It's how we uh, keep the lights on. It's how we pay these guests, and, and Grant has been so generous with his time. But uh, Grant, is there anything else we should talk about? Hmm. 
Well, we could talk about the meaning of life. Oh, we could. <laughs> oh, but the show's over in two minutes. Oh, darn. I, you know, because I had a perfect answer, but time is short. Oh, we'll do it. Sorry. We'll do it on Grant Geisman part two. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> news at 11. Hey, so, uh, well, I have two other cuts here. Do you want me to play a little bit of each of these? That you can talk about those? Sure. Um, I think both of these have Tom Scott on them, and these are from my new album. So just play like a little bit of each. So here's a little bit of Fatback. Yeah. This fat back is not necessarily what you think it is. It has to do with the musical groove, the style. Okay, and then here, what's the other tune? Uh, oh, it's t it's a tune called This and That, this which and that. is the what you say when people go, uh, when someone asks you, hey man, what have you been doing? You go, I don't know, you know, this and that. <laughs> okay, let's check some of this out. Uh, Tom plays after the organ solo. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just I couldn't stop during the, the guitar solo. No, that yeah, definitely not. <laughs> well, then when the when the album is out, let me know and I'll put it in the the Monday newsletter that I send to everybody. Okay, thank you. And Good. then everybody can. Uh, now, where where do they find these albums? Are they streaming? Are they for sale or both or? Um, we're trying to figure all that out now. It's okay. been you know almost, like pretty much ten years or nearly so since I did my last album. So it was like, what what do you do now? Yeah, <laughs> you know. So we're going to find all that out. But I know how to make the music, that's, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to do it these days. I'm, I'm particularly kind of fond of band camp because you have to buy the albums. And they, they're one, one Friday a month, I think, they don't take any commission on it. So it's, it's ah. kind of a cool thing. I think they're trying to help out the artists. And I'm building a website for somebody where we're just selling the tracks directly, downloads from the website. Yeah, I've been playing with um, my friend Bernie Dressel's okay. big band, the BBB, lately. Yeah. And he doesn't do any streaming. You have to buy his physical product, or maybe um, there's some kind of high resolution thing you can buy from him. Well, but can, it's I, no I streaming. A couple of those, and I got the CD from one, and then the digital download from another one. Yeah, yeah. But uh, which I think is good, you know, because yeah. the the streaming. We can do a whole show on the streaming. Well, look, because these things, no matter how cheaply you try to do it, they still cost money. Yeah. And you know, the streaming thing, it, you do not make enough to buy a Starbucks. Cup of, yeah. cup of coffee, let alone pay for a 10 or 12 track album of original music. So, you know, it, you have to support the, the, uh, the artist or it's just going to go away eventually. 
Yeah, that's a, we and I were having a conversation, which we should do a whole show just on uh, how to get your music out there and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, so uh, which would be which would be great. But uh, you know, we're kind of out of time unless uh, there's some magical something we want else want to talk about. But I think we kind of covered a lot of bases here. We've had a good audience. I want to say thanks to. Uh, uh, Taylor and Toby and Wayne and Phil and, and uh, Tom out there and uh, Toby and Lucia. Oh, and Joyce is here. I didn't say hi to Joyce. Joyce is one of our regulars. So uh, hi there, Joyce. And uh, and I just want to say thanks to everybody for coming out. And Grant, we got to get you back in here either to play or talk or something. Let's do it. And I'll leave you with the C69 chord from Two and a Half Men. All right. Men. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, they love that one. So. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, no, you're too kind, too kind. <laughs> been their favorite. <laughs> so, hey, here's the outro, and you know, uh, pay attention. It takes me forever to do this, and I pay that voiceover guy a ton. So, uh, anyway, we'll see you guys Thursday night. Be back in two days, right here. Uh, thanks for, for joining us. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us at Live at Zero BPM. These videos will be archived on YouTube and Facebook, so tell your friends. These Jazz Roundtable shows will also be released as a podcast, so please subscribe. Coming up on Thursday, April 14th, it's Jeff Pfeiffer and Socrates' trial featuring Jeff Pfeiffer, Andy Waddell, Harlan Hodges, Eric England, and Rodolfo Zuniga. Showtime, 7 to 8 p.m. Pacific. Go to live at 0bpm.com for details and to sign up for our mailing list. Also, find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. See you soon.